If you are born blue bloods like your husband, flinging up skyscrapers, his wife's a proper blue blood, I'll give you a clue. Darius, we can't keep the princess waiting. Blue blood, you know. Why do we keep referring to something like blue blood? Human blood is actually red. Usually, we use this term specifically to address a member of a wealthy, upper-class family or ancestry. But why exactly blue blood? Not green, not red, but blue. We may find an answer in ancient legends and stories. In the ancient world, the right to rule was something only gods and their blood descendants had. The question is, what is the meaning of the term gods? When ancients were talking about different fields of human knowledge, all of them agree on the same thing. This knowledge or that technology were granted by those who they called gods. The question is how to understand the term gods. We can think about them as fiction or a myth, a deification of ancestors. But we can also think about them as representatives of some highly advanced civilization, much more advanced than our ancient ancestors. For instance, if we took an ancient Roman and put him into our civilization with all our technologies, television, internet and so on, for him it would look like a civilization of gods. We should point out that in legends, ancient gods weren't spirits in the modern understanding. They had flesh and they were living amongst humans. So we are talking about some representatives of a highly advanced civilization most likely exo-civilization, who were technologically superior to our ancestry and whom our ancients treated like gods. But what if those ancient gods literally had blue blood? This could be used to prove that one is a descendant of the sacred family and has the full right to rule. But what if the blue blood phenomenon was a real thing? Something that was very specific to the ancient gods' physiology. So what is blue blood? Human blood is red. One of its main functions is the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as various nutrients to the cells and the transport of metabolic waste products away from those same cells. Oxygen is the principal element that our body uses for energy production via very complex chemical processes. The important thing for us is that, as a side product of these reactions, a lot of carbon dioxide in our body is produced and must be removed constantly. So transferring these gases is the main function of the blood. To do so, it has special molecules with a metal ion in them. We call them respiratory pigments. Human respiratory pigment is hemoglobin. It's bright red when oxygenated, and it's red because of ions in the metal ion in it. But even with a metal ion-based blood, its colors may vary from green to violet. As it turns out, oxygen can be carried by other metal ions as well, so evolution didn't limit itself in choice here. Surprisingly, we have species with blue-colored blood on our planet too. This color is caused by hemocyanin, a respiratory pigment based not on iron, but copper. In fact, this pigment is very widespread in the sea life world. Some snails, spiders, crustaceans, cuttlefish, crabs and octopi have blue blood, not red. Actually, blue blood exists. For example, mollusks, octopuses have it. This is a copper-based blood. If we substitute iron of iron to iron of copper, we will get hemocyanin. In other words, blue blood. But is it possible that not just lower animals, but hominids can have a blue blood as well? It was scientifically proved, and has been known for a long time, that the environment can greatly affect the elemental composition of living organisms. This is accompanied by a change in the chemical composition of the body. There can be chemical mutants with changes in the nucleus, such as chromosome numbers and so on. And such variability can become hereditary. It's understandable that in a situation where there's a particular element deficiency, evolution will substitute it with one that is in abundance to secure its mission. On our planet, evolution bet on the iron-based blood that is common for most organisms. 
Iron is constantly circulated in our body, just as any other microelement. 90% of it stays in the body and then is re-included to the new blood cells and respiratory pigment. There is no lack of iron on our planet. Iron is the second most common metallic element on Earth after aluminium. Despite the fact of the lack of an easily assimilated iron, evolution went on the iron-based blood physiology anyway. Thus, we can conclude that a hemoglobin-based pigment is more effective than other metals and there is no critical lack of iron for organisms in nature. But let's imagine another situation. On some exoplanet, there is less iron than on Earth, and there is excess of copper instead. What element will be chosen by evolution then? The answer is obvious. It will be copper-based respiratory pigment transferred with a baby blue blood. Could it really happen that some planet has more copper than iron in its crust? Let's have a look at our Sun. According to one study, Earth has more iron in its crust than the Sun has percentage-wise. And the Earth has a hundred times less copper than on the Sun. But the chemical composition of the Sun should correspond to the protoplanetary cloud from which Earth was formed. And if a very high concentration of iron can be caused by data inaccuracy, we still have a lack of copper. This obviously means that the answer is yes. The planet can have much more copper in its crust than we have now. It means that some exoplanet from which the ancient gods came from, according to ancient legends and stories, could have more copper than iron. I stand on the base of assumption that in some aspects, myths tell truth literally, including the part about the origins of the gods. In all mythology, gods that were giving knowledge come from the heavens. So that literally means that they came from the heavens, or how would we understand today from another planet? And I'm gravitating towards this version, not even because of ancient artifacts that exist and testify about highly advanced technologies, but also as an option suppose space origins of this advanced civilization, but because the space in which we live is equal. I mean, if these gods appeared from nowhere, ancients could say that they came from west, east, from the ground, from the top, etc. Everywhere in legends you'll find very specific origins of the ancient gods. Gods came from the heavens. So if the ancient gods arrived on our planet with its lack of copper and excess of iron relatively to them, they must have adapted to this new circumstance. Firstly, they should constantly replenish their organisms with copper. We know that erythrocytes, red blood cells that carry hemoglobin, live only 120 days. This is why constant replenishment with iron is required for blood formation. The same should be true for gods as well, but instead of iron, it should be copper. Secondly, iron is more chemically active element than copper. Thus, once in the blood of gods, it aims to substitute copper in chemical reactions. In other words, iron was toxic for them, and they would have to avoid it at any cost. The simplest way to battle iron is to stick to a specific copper-rich diet. Iron is very chemically aggressive and it starts to compete with copper once in the body. And if we suppose that species that arrived on our planet had a blue blood, which means copper-based blood, they found themselves into a situation where all fauna have iron-based physiology. Iron is toxic for them. They started moving humankind to the products that are more favorable for them, but not humans. This might shed light on the Neolithic Revolution when humanity universally switched from hunter-gathering to agriculture. The accepted narrative is that humans gave up hunting and gathering as soon as they discovered agricultural technology because it made life easier and safer. This is not quite right. On this account, the adoption of farming calls into question any simple narrative of human progression from hunting and foraging to swiddening and then to agriculture proper. Agriculture almost certainly entailed a large increase in drudgery and, as we shall see, declines in health and life expectancy. Looking backward, farming seems to be man's first major step toward civilization. 
It cannot, however, have looked that way to those who first embarked on it. There are plenty of ethnography research that shows that transitions from hunting and gathering to agriculture was extremely non-profitable for an ancient human. In fact, humans spent thousands of years trying to preserve their hunter-gatherer lifestyle. According to ancient legends and stories, the switch to agriculture wasn't our ancestors' idea at all. Knowledge and technology was granted by ancient gods in a ready-to-use form. Apparently, it had very strong connection to copper. So the products that ancients allegedly transitioned to, or in fact, they were forced to transition, all these grains are very poor for the iron. For instance, there's a lot of iron in legumes, vegetables, berries, strawberries and cherries in particular, and meat. Copper-rich products are grains, cereals, and bread. Basically, this switch from hunter-gathering to agriculture makes no sense, because all the iron we needed was literally at hand. And we know that some communities, like Australian Aboriginals, spent thousands of years preserving their hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Under external pressure, humanity turned to production of poor for iron and rich for copper food, despite the fact that the human body never lacks copper even during pregnancy, when women experience a deficit of many microelements. So we can conclude that this decision was made by the gods for their own personal interest. Why ancients transitioned to the wheat-based agriculture and not to root vegetables agriculture that has 10 to 100 times more effective productivity? Because root vegetables are very rich for iron and this was not profitable to so-called gods. Moreover, cereals not only have little iron, they also have substances such as phosphates and phytins, which create sparingly soluble salts and reduce absorption of iron in the body. The hypothesis that ancient gods had hemocyanin-based blood allows us to look differently at some interesting details of the ancient legends and stories. Copper has strong antibacterial characteristics. Its healing properties have been known for a very long time and were used in the traditional medicine of many nations. Such antibacterial characteristics were even used in space medicine, where textile impregnated with copper kept medical tools sterile for nine months or more. A high concentration of copper in the gods' blue blood and a low amount of iron in their diet would boost antibacterial properties that their blood already had. Maybe this was the secret to their extremely long life, which almost looked like immortality to the ancients. Since copper is blue in the oxygenated state, species with blue blood would look paler than we do now. But since skin color comes from various, at least three, types of melanin, not our blood chemistry, it is unlikely there would be much difference in appearance, except a slight blue pallor. Ancient Indian gods are the best example of what they could look like. In nature, copper deposits contain a lot of silver, Silver accompanies a copper everywhere. This is so much a connected phenomenon that modern silver mining usually happens simultaneously with copper mining. Almost one-fifth of all the world's silver is mined from copper deposits. This means that on the planet of gods, there would be a lot of silver as well because the laws of physics work the same everywhere. Like copper, silver has very strong antibacterial properties. Water from silver jugs has tiny particles of silver in it that even in an extremely low concentration has antibacterial properties because silver can block the enzyme systems of microbes. And that also adds some credit to the immortality of gods. Moreover, it's widely known that an overdose of silver causes an irreversible change of skin color to bluish tones that in conjunction with the blue blood of gods can increase effects of the blue skin. Despite all its benefits, hemocyanin-based blue blood has a serious drawback in that it cannot effectively transport carbon dioxide out of cells. If the concentration of carbon dioxide increases in blood, this causes a high level of acidity and shift in pH of blood, which is bad for overall health. 
pH is an indicator of acidity or alkalinity of a solution. In our blood, hemoglobin takes care of about 75% of the ability of the blood to hold pH within a stable 7.35 to 7.45 value. And this value is stable, even under very radical changes in nutrition and other external factors. But the god's blue blood contains not hemoglobin, but hemocyanin, or another copper-based respiratory pigment that doesn't change its acidity with oxygen concentration. As a result, it is not capable of neutralizing negative changes from high concentrations of carbon dioxide. The result is a high blood acidity can cause more than 200 illnesses and cancer. A high level of acidity is the perfect environment for bacteria, viruses, parasites, and the growth of cancer cells. To counter this situation, an organism would use the minerals in joints liquid, bones and teeth, which will cause joint diseases, teeth cavities, and osteoporosis of bones, as well as collateral damage to the kidneys. Multiple studies have established that even a 0.1 shift of the blood pH value can cause serious harm to the body. The shift of the blood's pH by just 0.2 points will cause a coma. We can find the proof that such negative influence on ancient gods' physiology had taken place in historical documents. From the history of Egypt written by Egyptian priests and researcher Manetho, we know that in the first 12,300 years, Egypt was ruled by seven great gods. During the Second Dynasty, there were 12 divine rulers who ruled for 1,570 years, that is 130 years for each god. Then Egypt was ruled by semi-gods, each of them ruled for 120 years only. According to this data from Manetho, we can see a constant decline of their reigns. We can conclude that such long ruling periods of the first generation of gods could be a reason why people believe them to be immortal. But we shouldn't understand immortality here literally. As we know, gods at the end of their reign on earth departed to the afterlife where they continued their ruling. Sumerian and Indian gods were effectively able to kill each other, as did the gods of American Indians and gods of other nations. So if we look at terms of reign of gods of Egypt as defined by longevity of their life, we will see a clear reduction in life expectancy. Thus, the shortening of their life was constant and inevitable for them. There must be a reason why it happened, and it looks like it was the negative influence of environmental factors on our planet which were unfriendly for their physiology. That could happen only in one case. If the conditions on the Earth differed substantially from the conditions on the home planet of the gods with something very significant to them. But according to legends, this difference wasn't so different as to be crucial. The main group of the gods didn't use spacesuits, so the composition of the Earth's atmosphere was close to their homeland. Ancient legends and stories tell us that gods didn't leap about on the Earth's surface like astronauts on the Moon. Thus, their home planet's gravity was similar to ours. And as was mentioned before, they consumed Earth food but needed a special copper-rich diet. Here, we should recall our assumption that gods had copper-based blue blood that had a seriously limited ability to transport extra volumes of carbon dioxide out of their body. So this could be a crucial factor for them, because hemocyanin or other copper-based respiratory pigment, unlike humans' hemoglobin, did not have abilities to neutralize the excessive acidity in the blood. So the assumption of a copper-based blue blood has a lot of reference that can be found in the ancient legends. This, combined with real empirical understanding of the impacts of a civilization of gods on ancient society, might finally allow to understand some dramatic turns in our history.